Good afternoon. Um, it's a really great pleasure uh, to welcome you on behalf of myself and my co-organizers, Mark Landy uh, and Peter Scarry, to this conference honoring the work of James Q. Wilson. It's wonderful to see so many friends here uh, and so many people, students of Jim's and colleagues and admirers of Jim Wilson. Uh, Jim died, as you know, a little over a year ago. Since then, we've witnessed an outpouring of tributes to him, news stories, commentaries, many by people in this room, uh, panels sponsored by the Bradley Foundation uh, and RAND. Uh, and this isn't the end. Uh, there will be a conference at Pepperdine School of Public Policy uh, next year on uh, Jim's book, The Moral Sense. I can't think of any political scientist who achieved have, uh, such a claim or one that deserved it anymore. Uh, those of us, over the past year, many of us have reread books that we read many years ago by James Q. Wilson. Uh, we have read some of the books that we never quite got to. Um, and speaking for myself, I'll say what I'm really amazed about is how much I continue to learn, to learn um, to appreciate the depth and the breadth of his work. Um, he continues to teach us. The official title of this conference is somewhat ungainly. It is called Thinking About Politics, a conference dedicated to exploring and perpetuating the political insights of James Q. Wilson. It's not exactly a bumper sticker. Um, but as this suggests, one goal, our, our goal is not just to honor a great scholar, but to reinvigorate the tradition that Jim exemplified. This is not a tradition that is necessarily very well represented in the American Political Science Review or other contemporary acad uh, academic journals, to put it mildly. Uh, this approach to the study of politics is detached from day-to-day -day partisanship, but attuned to the concerns of the average citizen. It places institutions at the heart of political analysis, but is very curious about the types of public policies these institutions produce. It is deeply theoretical in the sense that it seeks to understand essential elements of human nature, but it avoids the academic jargon in theoretical pretenses that deform so much contemporary social science. Now, like his mentor, Edward Banfield, Jim Wilson, was also something of a skeptic. Um, he would have been appalled to think that at a conference like this, uh, we were developing new dogmas or he, that his uh, students had turned into disciples. Uh, to, so to maintain the spirit of his political science, uh, we expect the panelists to be critical, um, to point out things that he might have missed, uh, and to think, point out things that he maybe failed to take into account. Um, I was really pleased to see how many of the papers said basically, I deeply admire James Q. Wilson, but here's where I disagree with him. Uh, the planning for this conference has gone hand in hand with um, uh, development of a new website called J, uh, jqwilson.org, and I hope you'll take a look at it. Uh, it was developed um, by uh, Andy Zwick, where is Andy? Um, who put a tremendous amount of thought and effort into this, and John Barry, who is here, um, uh, helped a great deal in putting things together. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at the website, and if you have any additional uh, information, things you sh think should be added to the website, especially things relating to teaching, syllabi or other things, then let John or Andy know. Uh, I'd like to thank a few people who have done a lot of work um, to put, make this conference possible. Um, our part of the support for the Harvard part comes from the Center for American Political Studies uh, and the Harvard Program on Constitutional Government. And I'd like to thank Laura Donaldson and Lily Halpern-Smith, who, who have helped us coordinate. Uh, the Boston College part of the program re received significant financial and administrative support from the Political Science Department, the Tip O'Neill Fund, the Boston College Initiative for the Study of Constitutional Democracy, and the Thomas W. Smith Foundation. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank uh, Karina Orvalis and Isaiah uh, Davidson Weiss at BC, and Yale Levin and Rory Schachter, who are here today. Um, so especially if Yale, uh, if you have logistical questions, she can help you. Things related to parking uh, today or tomorrow or anything, uh, sh she will be able to help you. But most of all, I would like to thank Shirley G. from the Political Science Department at Boston College, who I think all of you have had multiple emails <laughs> with. Shirley isn't here today, but what I would ask you to do is when you see her tomorrow, 
tell her how much that you show the appreciation <coughs> you just said because she's worked day and night at this um, and has really done a great job. Um, we have a very busy schedule um, for the next two days, so I will get right to the uh, first panel. Um, and I will uh, start by introducing the chairman of that panel, David Mayhew, who is in so many ways a sterling professor at Yale. <laughs> Uh, David is not only a leading expert on Congress and parties, uh, but he is one of political science discipline's true iconoclasts. Uh, I, feel, I was going to say that he knows more about American political history than anyone, but I just ran into Mickey Keller, so um, you two are at the top. Um, uh, so it is appropriate um, that one of our, the nation's leading experts on parties and po political organizations will chair our first panel. And we will, we assume that Jim Caesar will show up at some point. <laughs> David. I'll come up here. I'll put my backpack here so I can see what I'm saying. I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here. I was not a personal associate of Jim's, but from a distance, he was major. He was spectacular. Not quite of the, Senate of the same generation, but almost. I want to start by introducing the other members of the panel, including, um, including Jim, who probably will show up. We're, we're, we, have, we have two people who wrote papers who are here, then we have commentators. The two people who wrote papers, have the papers gone around? I think they have. They, they have they're on the website. They're on the website. To uh, Steve Tellis, Steve, Steve yep. Tellis on the far right there, associate professor at Johns Hopkins. He's written about the politics of the policy process, American, the American conservative movement, charitable foundations, and organization theory. He had a book a few years ago called The Rise of the Conservative Legal Movement. And currently, he's working on charitable, charitable foundations and on uh, changing conservative positions on mass incarceration, which we were just talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, Mark Landy. Uh, moving over next to Steve is also an author of one of the papers. Uh, Mark is professor of political science at Boston College. His recent articles include, these are nice titles, Obama and FDR, uh, Obama, that's FDR, Obama and FDR, Terror and the Executive, The Presidency in the Eye of the Storm, and he's a co-author of books that include Presidential Greatness and uh, American Government, colon, Balancing liberty and democracy, which it does try to do. The commentators, besides myself, uh, will include, I hope they will, uh, McGee Young, who's next. McGee is Associate Professor of Political Science at Marquette, an author of Developing Interests, colon, Organizational Change and the Politics of Ad Advocacy, three years ago, as well as articles in Studies in American Pol Political Development and elsewhere. He's also the founder of a software company. Is that right? All right. And Jim Caesar, I'll introduce him. Any? There he is. I'm just introducing you, Jim. Hi. I was going to uh, take your place and uh, fake what you were about to say, but I don't have to do that. <laughs> Hi. It's good to see you. These are these are these are four old friends uh, to my right here now. Jim Caesar is professor of politics at the University of Virginia and a senior fellow at the at the Hoover Institution. He's an author of many books on uh, American politics and American political thought, including uh, Presidential Selection, one of my favorites, uh, Liberal Democracy and Political Science, and uh, Designing a Polity. And in recent times, he's been authoring or co-authoring book, <coughs> book after each of the presidential elections. The most recent one is called After Hope and Change. Is that right? Got the title right? After Hope and Change. What comes after that? <coughs> uh, Marty Schefter. I could not be here. Uh, uh, we could not be here. He had an accident. Is that correct? Uh, Marty was was he sent a brief paper and also a brief statement. Bart, Marty is is uh, is uh, at Cornell, professor of government at Cornell. He's the uh, author of many books, yeah, um, political crisis, fiscal crisis about New York City, the the condition and the fate thereof, uh, political parties and the state. He's written about, and he has a comparator strain to him as well as an American strain, does Marty. 
and um, Politics by Other Means with Ben Ginsburg a few years ago. Many other works. Uh, uh, Marty sent a brief statement. He could not come. He wanted to be here. He couldn't come. He sent a brief statement as well as the paper that he wrote. And I'm going to read the brief statement. It's of, it's of a length which I think uh, authorized, in fact, mandates that. This is uh, Mar Marty Shifter on James Q. Wilson. Actually, it's a precy of Wilson's writing and thought uh, on, a, on a particular, particular and important uh, strain. James Q. Wilson was the outstanding political scientist, this is Marty Schefter's brief piece, was the outstanding political scientist writing about American domestic politics and public policy over the last half century. That is from his first publications in 1960 to his last in 2010. But his most influential articles appeared in journals, such as The Public Interest, I remember them well, Commentary, that addressed an audience exceeding, um, extending considerably beyond academic political science, a large and very influential, uh, very, uh, influential pieces before a large audience. In his, artic in his article, American Politics Then and Now, which Commentary published in 1979, Wilson noted that when he began studying American politics as an undergraduate in the early 1950s, he learned that six or seven, these, that these six or seven most powerful interest groups in the country back then were the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce, together comprising the business lobby, the AFL and CIO, that is to say the labor lobby, the, the, the AFBF, the Agricultural Lobby, that is, the American Medical Association, the Doctors' Lobby, and the American Legion, the Veterans' Lobby, all those lobbies. These lobbies all sought to advance the narrow economic interests of their members. By lobbying, the members of these organizations sought to secure benefits that were greater than they would have received from market alone, but did not differ all that greatly from market payoffs. By contrast, um, Marty goes on, since the 1960s, again in recounting what Jim wrote, advocacy groups have sought to advance what they claim are the legal or constitutional rights of racial or ethnic minorities for which advocacy groups claim to speak, as opposed to the narrow economic interest back there. Such a claim does not depend on the group's efforts being actively supported by, it, by the members of its purported constituency. Indeed, as Wilson notes, advocacy groups they have no members whatever from the constituency to whose cause the advocates are dedicated. Rather, rather than having such members, groups that, groups that engage in rights talk, quote, end quote, I have sponsors, sponsors affiliated with nationally influential institutions, Steve Dallas will talk about this, such as pres prestigious universities, national communications for media and elite law firms. Wilson argues that the considerable influence that advocates of minority rights came to exercise in American politics during the late 20th and early 21st centuries reflected less the interests of advocates than their, than their political ideas. So the switch from an interest politics to an ideas politics is the emphasis that Jim gives us that Marty's telling us about here. And then he quotes, uh, he ends actually, Marty does, by quoting uh, Jim. <coughs> Congress today is susceptible to the power of ideas whenever there seems to be strong consensus as to, as to what those ideas are. Consumer protection, ecology, <coughs> campaign finance reform, congressional ethics are examples <coughs> of ideas with strong symbolic appeals that so long as the consensus endures are handled by a political process in which the advantage lies with the proponents of change. But sooner or later, a scandal, a shift in the focus of media attention, or the actions of a skilled political entrepreneur <coughs> will bring a compelling new idea to the top of the political agenda, and once again, action will become imperative. Weakened institutions, individualized politics, that's a picture of today, or at least of later, and the rise of an educated, idea-oriented public combined to make it highly advantageous for political entrepreneurs to identify and mobilize single-issue single constituencies. It's Marty's statement. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pricey of a considerable swatch of uh, Wilson's work back then and also in his most recent uh, writing, the, what, what it was then, what it's been since then. <coughs> I think what we'll do next is, uh, 
Uh, we, we, were, we were asked to, to this, that is, a, the, the paper writers, of whom we have two, are not supposed to present their papers. Rather, the commentators among us are supposed to give the gists of those papers and comment on the papers. And then the uh, writers of the papers will uh, recover, they pick up the pieces, and, uh, and go on. I guess that's what it is. So we're supposed to be critical, but I'm not going to be critical. <coughs> uh, we'll, we'll, go for, we'll go to, uh, we'll go, we'll go to, we'll go to, let's go, let's go. What did I give for an order? We'll go to, um, to McGee, and then to uh, Jim, and then I will do some um, cleanup after that, also with some points of my own. Thanks for having me. My name is McGee Young. I'm an associate professor at Marquette University. Um, and as David kindly noted, I have a book called Developing Interest, which Steve um, kindly brought a copy of. And I'll uh, are available on Amazon.com for 1995 in paperback. <laughs> It's an honor to be here. Um, I, I kind of look at this at this fellow panelist and I go, "How did I wind up with <laughs> Mayhew and Caesar and Landy and Tellus on a panel on James Q. Wilson?" Uh, this is for a younger academic. This is kind of one of those uh, sort of pinch yourself moments where um, you go, "Either there was an egregious mistake made somewhere along the way, um, or..." Um, I might be amounting to something as an academic, and this is kind of an ex it's an exciting uh, opportunity. I hope I don't blow it here, my, my moment in the sun. Uh, political Organizations, James Q. Wilson's book that we were sort of focusing on for this panel was published the year before I was born. So, um, so it literally predates me. Um, uh, I think, however, that this gives me a, a unique perspective on the work. Um, my, my academic career, um, doesn't exist outside of that work and its legacy. And so, well, um, you know, this work is, it, in, a, in, a, in a sense for me, it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So that it, it, all, it's sort of, it always has existed. Like I tell my undergraduates these days, um, you know, when I was a kid, the Soviet Union existed. And for them, that's, that's a concept that, that, that they can't um, mentally wrap their heads around. Uh, and so uh, political organizations has always existed. And what's the, what's the meaning of that? Um, I think intellectually, uh, it's fair to say that, that my work is, is firmly in the Wilsonian uh, tradition. Um, but oddly, it's not very directly <coughs> impacted uh, by Wilson's work. Um, it's, it's a less disagreeable work, for example, than Mansur Olson's work. Uh, there's, it's a book that, that, as I read it for the first time, uh, I mostly agreed with it. And, and so that's, that's kind of a, you know, when you're writing, when you're be developing your academic career and you run across a book that you mostly agree with, um, how do you, what do you do with that? How do you, how do you wrestle with that, with that kind of work? Yes. I'm, I'm filming up here. I'm getting in interference, and I think it's because this is so close to the mic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Get my backpack up here. The, the Mayhew method. You can have mine if you want. <laughs> oh, mine's right next to it. I could pull it up there. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Hugh Hecklow was, was on the, um, is Hugh here? So I'm going to paraphrase you, um, uh, steal from you, uh, if you will. It's not so much. Uh, so, so where 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 I'm coming from, whereas whereas Olson was wrong, uh, Wilson was merely incomplete, and um, and so I think some to some extent, some of the papers here reflect the the where where Wilson opens up brand new vistas of academic research for us to pursue, 
he doesn't inspire us to argue vehemently against the work, the conclusions that he draws. So this is not a good or a bad thing. This is just the nature of his scholarship for those of us in the younger generation, is they make us, it makes, his work makes us want to probe deeper and to ask new questions. So Steve Tellis picks up on some of these themes in his thoughtful uh, commentary on political organizations. And if you haven't had a chance to look at his paper, I would encourage you to do so, as well as to read his work, because it is among the best of, of I consider, my generation of political scientists um, who are writing on these issues. And he kind of makes four main points, and I'll, and I'll touch on these individually. And the first point wrestles with this question of organizational maintenance. I think this is probably the you know, as, as you're studying for comprehensive exams, Wilson, 1973, above all else, organizations seek, seek to survive. And it's, an, it's a fairly anodyne statement in and of itself, but it does reflect on the scholar, scholarly development of, of the study of organizations, that he had to make such a claim uh, at, at that point in time, uh, tells us a lot about what else was being written about, about interest groups. So organizations seek to survive. Uh, Steve tells us that this is a constructivist um, approach to the study of political organizations. If we have time, I'd like to push back against that a little bit um, because I don't think I don't think that's accurate. Um, what it what it suggests to me is not so much constructivism. That is the 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 scholar assigning value to. Uh, to a, a, a set of political phenomena, but rather a recognition that political leaders, political entrepreneurs, are themselves searching for value propositions in the world of politics. And that Wilson's work, as well as, and you generously cite mine, are interested in this quest for a value proposition that resonates with some sort of public or some sort of private audience that can, that can provide resources in an ongoing manner for an, for, for an organization. This, this pursuit of organizational maintenance leads uh, Steve to a second point, which is that the ecology of the organizational community in, in politics is defined by the availability of resources to support that community. And Steve's great work leads us to the role of, of foundations in supporting new organized interests, in particular in the 1970s and 1980s. So the Ford Foundation, for example, on the liberal side, and the <coughs> Olin Foundation on the conservative side, were instrumental in providing the necessary resources for new organizations to bypass the laborious process of going out and recruiting hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of members to provide them with the resources that they would need to continue themselves. That insight that, that these, that, and, and of course Jack Walker's work subsequently to, to Wilson's uh, helps us to understand this uh, in a lot more detail. That insight that these patrons, if you will, are responsible for the emergence of a new type of organization leads us to reflect on how those organizations then are affected by the fact that they're pursuing patronage, that is support from foundations, rather than support from members. How does that change the way that they govern themselves? They look a lot different internally than the older style of political organizations do. This is something that Wilson would want us to appreciate, that it matters how you get the, set of the resources that you need to keep going as an organization. It also I think, uh, and, and, and Steve's work continues to probe really interesting questions along this line, but it, it raises the question of what are the different types of organizational models that characterize contemporary advocacy organizations? We don't have a good list, a good typology. Typologies are kind of out of vogue in political science uh, these days. I think we should bring them back. What are the different types of organizational structures, the or organizational models that present themselves in the advocacy community today? If you read the Harvard Business Review, scholars of companies do a lot of this. There's a lot of rich literature now on, on organizational models in the world of business. They even, there are even um, new works being done on, on uh, business model generation. So you can actually uh, uh, look at a canvas that has 
the different organizational characteristics of different types of firms, I don't think this would be a bad exercise for political scientists to go through a little bit. In the spirit of Wilson, to think about how do we articulate interests in contemporary politics? What are the different ways that people organize themselves or that entrepreneurs create new organizations? Steve's paper does a great job of, of not just talking about these issues, but really focusing them through the lens of his own work, his research on the Ford Foundation and, and the Olin Foundation in particular. There's a couple of key insights that are worth touching on briefly. One is that the, the Ford Foundation was instrumental in the 1960s and 1970s in the rise of new types of organizations. Of in my own work on, on the environmental movement, the, the funding that the Ford Foundation provided for the Natural Resources Defense Council was critical for the emergence of that organization. And not only that, not only was it critical for the success of that organization, but it defined the organizational structure of the NRDC. This was a group that was consisting of, on the one hand, some Yale Law School students, and on the other hand, some New York lawyers, and the Ford Foundation brought them together and made them work together. Well, that's important. That has important implications for the environmental movement in the United States, as well as it's, it epitomizes what went on in general with the left in the 1960s and 70s because of the effects of these foundations. The liberal foundations were pretty keen to uh, support programs and, and professionalize the organizations that they were funding, in part because they were... Um, uh, scrutinized pretty closely by Congress as well as by the IRS. On the other hand, conservative foundations um, provided resources with much less oversight and with much less direction. And this allowed conservative organizations uh, much more latitude and freedom to actually build substantive organizations that weren't just uh, a set of programs linked together, but actually had an organizational infrastructure that could be uh, replicated over time. Steve argues that this, this difference in the way in which funders funded the organizations accounts in large part for the success of conservative interest groups in the 1980s and the relative uh, struggles that liberal uh, interest groups experienced during the same time frame. This is great work, and this is really uh, epitomizes what I think is the best of the legacy of Wilson. So what are some parting thoughts? some opportunities for further discussion. I argue that, I would argue that political organizations are still under-theorized. As political scientists, we still have a lot to learn about the way in which voluntary associations create and recreate themselves. And we could benefit from some more, more thought and effort put into that. Number two, can we get out of political science a little bit and start learning from the world of, of the business community, for example? Uh, can we steal some of the models from, from the Harvard Business Review and think about how uh, the pursuit of resources from a political, in a political organization might in some ways mirror the efforts of, of a new business to, to, to reach a customer base? There's obviously difficulties associated with that. David Hart's work um, suggests that business is not an interest group, but there's, these are organizations fundamentally, and, and there are, are, there's a lot of common ground here that could be explored. And I think we're left, in a sense, of, with, as a field of scholars who study political organizations, we're left wondering what the big questions are. As I go to the, to the uh, APSA or the Midwest and I sit in on the interest groups panels, there's a lot of small questions that are being asked. But the great thing about the scholarship of Wilson and others of his time is that they weren't afraid to ask big questions. So what kinds of big questions could we ask nowadays? I'd like to know, and I'm just going to throw this one out there, there's probably lots of other ones. Why it is that some organizations, when they're formed, are disruptive to politics. That they identify a value proposition that mobilizes a new set of voters, of foundations, a new way of achieving influence. 
that recasts politics for a generation. And at other times, a similarly new kind of organization will emerge, and it sustains the status quo. So how is it that we get disruptive innovation in the world of politics? What are the, me the mechanisms there? What differentiates the disruptive innovator from the sustaining innovator in the world of political science? I don't know the answer to that, but that's a big question. And I think that's the type of question that Wilson would appreciate us all diving into as we continue on in our own, in our own careers. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, all, all the more so to remember uh, Jim Wilson, who was my teacher here at Harvard and wrote my dissertation with him. Um, well, the uh, organizer, Shep, asked me, uh, uh, li limited the commentators to eight to 10 minutes uh, for our initial presentation. And um, I'll therefore try in an Aristotelian fashion to avoid the, the vice of uh, being too loquacious and speak 10 minutes and, or being too laconic and speak eight minutes. And I'm going to choose nine minutes <laughs> and uh, four and a half for, for each paper. Martin Schefter's paper um, treats the highly publicized and highly politicized concept of polarization. Everyone uh, speaking about this uh, concept today. It's uh, moved up from uh, the political situation in the country up to the uh, academic discourse and from academic discourse down to uh, political discourse. And everyone thinks they know what it means when they use it until you actually uh, try, try to think through what it means and the, the uh, concept begins to crumble into different pieces. Maybe they're related, but it's not one easy or simple concept. It's still being debated within uh, academic circles today. In fact, it would be hard to imagine what uh, Mo Fiorina and Alan Abramovitz would be doing. They'd be unemployed if it weren't for the concept of political polarization. And Wilson's article, uh, which he wrote in commentary uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the point where this concept was breaking out of academia and into the, the uh, political arena, I think uh, brought three things to the concept of our understanding of the concept of, of uh, polarization. First, he provided conceptual cl clarity about what its different components were. Then he provided historical perspective and then he provided a nonpartisan judgment to the concept. Now, the conceptual clarity, that would take us along a number of different paths too uh, detailed to go into, but I'll just mention this. He imagines, in a way, if you go through that article, what would be the mother of all, um, uh, the, the mother of all polarizations, uh, uh, the, the exact full-scale full polarization. Well, at the elite level, it would be elites separated into different organizations or parties. The organization or parties would uh, uh, be a, uh, a poles apart on some key and heartfelt issue, enough a heartfelt issue which really was important and, and could divide the country to its, uh, to its core. And if there were more than one issue involved, they would have to line up with that one. So you not only have the fact that people are on different sides, but the sides are far apart, and the sides are, uh, the differences are on, are on something really important. And then almost all the elites would have to fall into one of the, or two of these other categories. They would suck all the space of, uh, of elite behavior, such that there would be very few people floating around in the middle. You're either for us or against us. And that would, uh, in a way, define the, the, the whole context of elite politics. No room, then, for those entrepreneurs in the middle or those who want to compromise. In fact, very few compromisers around. Now, uh, the, the other level of, uh, of polarization would be the mass level. And in fact, uh, if you, you imagine the mother of all polarizations, it would pretty much parallel that, only with the people now uh, acting like the elites, that is. The people would be divided into recognizable groups and see themselves as part of that group, say, uh, two different parties. 
they would have to be deeply divided on some key issue, and if there were more than one issue, it would have to line up with that key issue, such that it could really wrench the nation at its heart. And then uh, almost all uh, the mass public would have to be in one of, of, the, of, those, of, of, the, of those groups, such that there would be very few floaters or independents or undecideds, um, fewer people um, to be interviewed 24 hours before election who still haven't made up their mind and therefore get all the attention of television programs. Now, as people who follow this debate know, um, uh, Abramowitz believes that uh, really uh, both of these conditions apply. It's both a mass and an elite phenomenon. We see it all around us today. Polarization is uh, everywhere, whereas Fiorina sees it mostly as an elite phenomenon. Uh, the mass really isn't that polarized in his view. Now, in Wilson's article, he not only helps us to understand these categories, but then he puts the issue in historical perspective because he asks the question, well, just, just don't go out and me measure how many of the mass are in one group or another, but what would be the amount of the mass that would have to be uh, in the polarized category to make it significant politically such that we could speak of, of important polarization? And you could only tell that by a comparative analysis that would look over history. For example, if you could imagine polls at the time of the Civil War, leading up to the Civil War, which you would treat in a way as the mother of polarization, probably he imagines that large parts of the public weren't that polarized if you took polls. But still, from the point of view of what's politically significant, enough were to make a difference. So it's not enough just to measure. You have to say what part of the measurement leads to enough to lead to the critical problems of polarization. And without being able to conduct the polls of those who are no longer with us, he reminds us that just the measurement of the, of the uh, phenomenon isn't enough. You have to put it in some historical context. And then he takes a nonpartisan, uh, I think, view of polarization. He looks at it from a distance. And when he judges it, whether it's harmful or help, uh, to the United States, he judge, judges it in a nonpartisan way. His concern in particular with the polarization that we do have was the signals it can send about the, the divisiveness of the United States in addressing questions of foreign affairs, where the specter of uh, this division could uh, be a sign of weakness for the nation. But most of those who uh, study polarization, in fact, uh, use it as a partisan concept, as a stick to beat others over the head. One version of polarization was uh, the uh, idea, preferred idea of responsible parties, which the American Political Science Association endorsed in the 1950s. And when you look at that, you can see it was a thinly veiled attempt to favor the ideas of progressive uh, elites, um, to uh, call for cohesive political parties, so you could say se semi-polarized parties, such that the left could uh, take its uh, majority within a majority and use it to govern the country effectively. And so the left favored the idea of responsible parties until about the time of the 1980s and a little later when it looked like the right could achieve a majority in the country, at which point uh, responsible parties began to look less attractive. In 2008, when we move into this period, Polarization became bad in the sense that the minority would not compromise with the majority. It was never a problem, uh, polarization, that the majority would not compromise with the minority. That's, I think, the way it was used. The unhealthy polarization uh, in the uh, Affordable Care Act was said to be that the majority was, uh, was not said to be that the majority was forced into a mold but that the minority wouldn't go along with the majority. That's the current view of polarization as well. The minority won't go along with the majority if you count the Republicans as the minority. And in certain books, we have uh, leading political scientists, Tom Mann and Norm Nornstein. Since I only have nine minutes, I'll put them together and just call them Mornstein. <laughs> Mornstein, uh, in a way, represent the view in Washington of this uh, position. You could say the establishment view in Washington. Or in Schatzschneider's term, you could put it this way, the chorus of those who speak of polarization sing with a strong progressive accent. Now, the Schefter essay then uh, asks the question, what are the causes of polarization? 
Wilson was a great student of causes. Um, attending his class, and it often seemed that he explained many things so thoroughly that by the end of the class, you thought things could, could never be different than how they are, which was a source of a, a, a little bit of, of uh, difficulty when you left the class. But this was also a moderating uh, um, lesson because things uh, are, in many ways, locked in and difficult to, to change more than you would think. So it had a moderating effect. Still, in his uh, magisterial treatment of uh, causality, there was always the key distinction remaining between causes that might be affected or managed by intelligent human agency, that is, those causes we can say something and do something about, and causes that you can't do anything about or that no sane person would want to do anything about. Now, in the case of polarization, uh, it's fortunate that the cause falls into the first category. It can be changed, and the change is shovel-ready. What, according to Martin Schefter, is the cause, the deepest cause of polarization? It's education or schooling, particularly the universities. More and more people are going to universities, and this, in Schefter's view, led uh, Schefter and Wilson to conclude that we're moving more and more into a politics of polarization and away from a politics of, of interest, schooling being the cause of that. And, of course, this could be remedied by bringing the bulldozers into the universities and dismantling them brick by brick. A particular uh, aspect or peculiarity of Wilson's work running through is this contrast he keeps drawing between interest and ideas. Now, Wilson was a person of ideas, but he was somewhat suspicious of the use of ideas in politics, uh, especially general ideas. His general view could parallel, let's say, Tocqueville's treatment of the physiocrats, or what he called the men of letters before the French Revolution. They had these general ideas, but no experience with politics. And these general ideas pulled them further and further away from contact with the real and particular realities of political life. Interest, or at least interest on a small scale, however, uh, in some ways, demeaning, connects you in some way to the real world. So I think a theme of Wilson's work is between, as between uh, people of ideas and people of interest, you'd be safer to choose interest. General ideas get simpler and less connected. So if you look at college campuses today, it's all going towards two ideas, either libertarianism or human, human, humanized social justice. These are the two camps. And the, uh, everyone's falling into those two categories, two simple general ideas that are winning out right and left on our campuses. Well, let me now turn to uh, Mark's paper in the final four and a half minutes. Marx is a, uh, Landy's is a sweeping paper. It covers all of American history. <laughs> it treats uh, the organization of parties. Uh, uh, so in Wilson's on, uh, view of, of the world, you have human beings, you have governments, but you have these things in between uh, organizations, and they, can, they, they have uh, certain patterns of behavior. And of course, a great deal of his work was uh, devoted to trying to describe what uh, the nature of organizational behavior is. We have human nature, we have organizational nature. And I think he did as well as anyone else in beginning to describe the, the motives of these, these uh, artificial creatures who are brought into being. And uh, why is it important to discuss parties in terms of organizations, uh, as Mark Landy does? Well, parties, uh, as we uh, know them, once were organizations, and uh, they followed the laws of organizations, and the party organizations controlled an awful lot inside of politics. So by understanding party organizations, we understood, uh, you could say, the core of American electoral politics. As I said, in the 19th century and the party organizations, elections were far too important to leave to the candidates. It was for the organizations to, uh, to determine the character of our political campaigns. Now, Landy uh, applies Wilson's scheme uh, of three types of uh, motives for people to, to get into organizations, uh, let's say purpose or goals, uh, um, interest, that they're given some not exclusionary interest, a, a buy-off of some sort, 
and uh, what Wilson calls solidarity, the, 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 the idea that you can be with others and have a, a human community with others through an organizational activity. And uh, he, of course, he based his discussion of party organizations on this framework. And Landy applies it uh, historically, looking through the sweep. He said, what was the dominant types of organizations? He finds purpose to be a little too high, uh, interest to be a little bit too low. And in good Goldilocks fashion, he picks something in the middle, uh, uh, this form of organi party organization that's a kind of mixture of purpose, um, solidarity incentive and interest, which he associates with one of his teachers, Carrie McWilliams. And I think Landy saw this kind of party organization as uh, uh, enduring through American history, the large parts of the 19th century, into the 20th century. But now it seems to have break, broken down and is fading and dying away. So uh, in Landy's view, we're, we're in, in a kind of crisis. We don't have the proper organization of parties to provide for the proper politics. What exactly uh, do we have? Um, in, in modern politics. Well, in this sense, his paper begins to parallel a little bit, it seems, Schefter's paper. Uh, we have a lot of purposive incentive around ideological politics, so you'd think, as he points out. And the cause, once again, is educated people. The solution, again, would be the same, to dismantle the university. But he mentions, or one could mention, other causes as well uh, of this change, institutional <coughs> causes. Uh, the elimination of party nominations in favor of primaries, which Banfield and Wilson discussed in city politics, already begins to, to make the organizations, the pure organizations, less important. And campaign finance laws, which whatever their good intentions, if the intentions were good, have really served in a way to divert money outside of the, uh, much of the money outside of the political parties, eliminating the organization's control of that vital resource. So that's the, uh, the uh, it seems to be the situation, uh, uh, key situation in which uh, we find ourselves uh, today. But then uh, uh, Landy adds a, another uh, a twist to this. But before I get to that last twist, uh, I want to point out maybe a, a slight difficulty. Um, he speaks of the party in the modern age. Uh, the problem is that uh, the party organization is, a, is a, an entity, as Wilson treats it, is an important part of our uh, political landscape, but not that important anymore. That is, the thing that's in, under the control literally of the party organization is limited. <laughs> what we refer to in the party in our minds is not just that organization, but a whole series of op, uh, operators inside the political world that are linked with the parties in what you could say is a kind of web of interaction. For example, in the uh, Democratic Party, you have some of the teachers' unions. They're practically, when we use the word Democratic Party, we think of them as part of the party. We, uh, 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 we have, in addition uh, to, to entities like, uh, like that, uh, we have uh, labor unions, and um, uh, we have big contributors. We have the candidate's own organization. If you ask what's more important today, really, in American politics, where's Obama, what's Obama using to, to try and drive public opinion, it's uh, not the Democratic National Committee. It's his own organization, which he set up and it's kept going. So there's a series of organizations. Therefore, the analysis of organization, in, in the pure Wilsonian sense, can't capture the full phenomenon of party today, which really is more, I think, justly described as a web of interaction. And therefore, this idea of a web would have to be how we would treat parties, of which you could use Wilsonian analysis for each particular organization, but the, the agglomeration of what we mean parties is really this interaction of different entities that make up the, the two parties, and that's just uh, the way things are and likely the way that things will be. That would be the, the context in which you would have to treat uh, the parties insofar as the, uh, their organizations. This is a series of organizations. But what uh, Landy adds to the mix, in, in addition to um, confirming corroborating Schefter's view that Wilson speaks of purpose as being important or ideology is important today. It's the fact that parties in their own way, modern parties today, are engaged in massive schemes of interest, uh, using interest to, to buy members or at least voters. I think this is an insight of this paper. Our modern parties and uh, our payoff schemes, huge payoff schemes, which are uh, granting certain benefits to different groups, 
which are loosely allied with one party or another. So uh, we would find uh, today in, in American politics, you have a party that buys certain interests through uh, an, an environmental write-offs or um, pays for the uh, public pension benefits of, of some. In effect, what people realize is that they are associating with the party because of a particular benefit that they achieve. Not just the benefit that will go to everyone, like Social Security, but a benefit that will, go, that will go to them because they support that party, and particularly because the other party may oppose that benefit altogether. So while there's a lot of, uh, of uh, highfalutin talk about purposes and goals, underneath there's an underbelly of huge interest politics going on. You could say it's too big to be seen. It's so much a part of our politics that we barely see this. We bar barely uh, understand the degree to which interest uh, dominates in, in parts of our parties and payoffs dominate. And uh, the Wilsonian idea of interest is keeping alive this uh, web of, par of, of parties on both sides, maybe one side more than the other. Uh, for final comment, uh, just reflecting uh, a little bit on this theme of interests and ideas, which I see running through Wilson and also his uh, collaborator and teacher, Ed Banfield. It seems to me that um, when you look at the, their work, uh, that both of them were um, sensible and moderate people above all. And they didn't expect that much from politics, uh, but they worried uh, about the dangers that politics could fall into. And so when they approached politics this way, they understood that petty corruption, though not ennobling, uh, wasn't the worst of options inside of American political life. That it could go along with a kind of moderation if, uh, uh, for, for the institutions and the elected officials. Uh, far more so than a politics of uh, so-called high ideals, which offered a much greater threat I think, to what they saw as the stability of politics, in just the way I think that, uh, that Tocqueville had described. And so, um, though everyone likes to uh, take the occasion, as we all do, to dismiss the demeaning aspects of, uh, say, small and petty interests, um, the alternative, it seems, to, uh, that both papers seem to suggest is something worse. We're entering an era of mass demagogic politics with spectacular buy-offs uh, at the highest levels, at prices and, and amounts hitherto unseen. And um, I think this would be the political situation that uh, Jim Wilson would have to turn to in the years uh, ahead. Thank you. Back, back, back. <clears throat> I'd like to do something a little different. I'll be brief. <laughs> I will, uh, no, I don't mean different in that sense. I will skirt the papers, which have been dealt with well. I, um, I, I, but this is relevant to a panel on uh, Wilson and political parties, I think very relevant. And it's about political science and how to uh, conduct political science, which probably nobody has done better than Wilson. And uh, it goes back into Wilson's earlier writing, um, back to when I was a shaver, reading Wilson's earlier writing. He wasn't that much older than I was, but somewhat. For me, when I was starting out as a political scientist, um, major works were Wilson's book, The Amateur Democrat, which probably most of you have read, about those folks in um, Manhattan and Los Angeles and uh, Chicago, particularly most memorable, the ones in Manhattan. What were those folks in the upper, upper Manhattan doing? What were they up to in concocting their reformism? Well, he went and took a look. He called it uh, the reformism he found, am amateur democracy, a study of a certain political mentality, which it certainly was. You needed to go look to find out what it was. <coughs> then I remember, this is another book, this is with Ben Banfield who was, after all, of course, close to Wilson, an extremely important formative book for me, which is very much about political parties, though not just that, and actually I'm not going to talk here just about his writing on political parties. There's a family of which is the books I'm talking about are, um, are, are members. It's the City Politics, the book, the book with that, the book with, um, with Banfield, City Politics, just enormously important. 
It is with, uh, in the, um, when reading, after reading The Amateur Democrat and uh, City Politics, I had to overhaul and to a certain degree abandon what I've thought about political parties and what I've thought, what I thought about city politics. It was a lesson, it was a good lesson for a youngster. And these books were, um, at least the latter, I don't know about The Amateur Democrat, was executed with a lot of associates uh, who were younger than, uh, than uh, City Politics, that is, younger than Ed and Jim, and went out there and did work with them. Now, um, the, the particular point I want to make is this, and it's about political science. Um, yes, these books took up, took up big questions, questions that were relevant to the society, uh, but they were also, they were also distinctive um, methodolo methodologically. That is what we see here is a methodology at work. That's what Jim did, and work, people working with him did was to go out there and interview, to go take a close look at settings in the real world, real settings in the real world, real world, find out what was going on in them, infuse into them notions and looking at them to be sure, and then um, reflect smartly, and I underlined the smartly on uh, what they'd found out, that what he and the associates had found in looking out there at settings in the real world. In the uh, city politics book, they had some, uh, the book depended for one thing on some uh, 30 or so reports by people who had gone and looked, look, taking a close look by uh, looking at uh, investigating, talking to people in politics in the various cities. I remember one by one of the reports by uh, Martha Derthick, for example, which I've always told her is wonderful <laughs> about the city of Cleveland. Now this early work by, um, by Jim, um, cooperation with Ed, was a, a preface, I think a necessary preface, to the book on political organizations, which came later. The conceptual, the theoretical book, Political Organizations, came later. I mean, it's a rich book. It, it sells um, uh, successfully the trio of those incentives which animate organizations, including parties, that is, material incentives, solidary incentives, and uh, purposive incentives, which, uh, which Mark, Mark and, um, and uh, Marty wrote about in their papers for us. But where do they come from? They came at least from the experience of the research experience of going out, going out and looking, going out and looking. Now, that may seem like a common sense thing to do. Indeed, it is a common sense thing to do. If you want to write about something, go and find out what about, about what it's like. Think about it beforehand and think about it afterwards, smartly if you can, as uh, Jim always did. And then tell us, and tell us in his case in these, in these uh, instances uh, memorably. memorably. I, the, uh, it's a way of doing political science. That is, it combines, it combines a rich experience out there with, after all, a taste for conceptualization. That's always with Jim, with concepts, making up small sets, uh, small sets, sets of, uh, with, with small numbers of concepts, it's always there. Uh, now once, this package of methodology was a, was a centerpiece in political science. That is back uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago, 30 years ago, you see it with Wilson, you see it with V.O. Key, my old advisor in his book, Southern, Polit Southern Politics. You see it in Bob Dowell's writing about New Haven, who governs. You see it in um, uh, Dick Fenno's soaking and poking work, he calls that out there with the members of the Congress. And you see it in Ed Banfield's work, in his own book, for example, on, uh, by himself on, uh, on Chicago. And, um, but no one was better at this kind of work than, than Wilson. That is over and over again, uh, informing us and educating us by deploying this methodology, it seems to me. He went out there and he did it over and over again. And not just on parties. I mean, the, the um, varieties of police behavior is a book like this in this vein. So is um, uh, The Politics of Regulation, a book like this in this vein. And uh, these books, some of these enterprises were used also, let it be said by Wilson, to educate people somewhat younger than him by getting them into his work, work his research enterprises. Um, and I, it seems to me in, 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 in applying, executing, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, merchandising this uh, methodology, uh, methodology, I mean, even beyond the, beyond the fact that he was dealing with big questions memorably, was uh, an extraordinarily important service to uh, American life, American scholarship, and to, um, and to political science. Now, in political science, this methodology has, um, has lost its place. Uh, since the since it was being applied by some of these folks, not not entirely. After all, lost his place. We do see ex executors of it, but it's not as central as it was, and it's probably unfortunate because uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, when Jim was working, 
uh, political science as a discipline uh, uh, had, probably had comparative advantage in this kind of research enterprise and might have had absolute advantage um, compared, for example, in both these respects with economics in this kind of research enterprise. And it's kind of a shame that the methodology has, this methodology has, uh, has lost its place in political science. I think the discipline is the, is the worst for it. And um, um, Shep was talking about reinvigorating the tradition. Uh, one way to help reinvigorate it would, would, would be to um, generate more of a presence for this methodological tradition in our own time. We're going to take, I guess now we're going to get responses, first of all, from, then we'll take, um, take uh, thoughts or, uh, or questions from, uh, so we're going to do that. Can we start with, uh, why don't we start with Steve since, uh, since, since McGee went first, okay? Um, I'll sit, I'll sit. Can everybody hear me? Um, so first of all, so I, want to, I want to say um, how much I appreciate David's last point, in part because I'm, uh, um, at Johns Hopkins, I teach uh, in pretty much all my classes, I'm now integrating um, a dimension of having to write case studies based on actual interviews. Now, we have the advantage of being, you know, a 45-minute mark train away from D.C., um, but this is a kind of methodology you can teach right now. You have to teach it in a different way than you teach other kind of methodologies, right? You teach it more like apprenticeship, right? So I take my students along on interviews with it, right? You, you learn like the way you learn art or lots of other things, right? You watch over cooking, right? You look over somebody's shoulder who knows what they're doing and you learn it and then gradually you can go and do it yourself. Um, I think there's a world of stuff out there, right? If you're looking for the really non-marginal um, things you can do in the world, right? In politics, right? You know, there, there are huge numbers of, of, of theoretically consequential stories, right? Um, but you have to find the stories first, right? And I always tell my students, if you find a really big story that looks that, like it's confusing or it doesn't mesh with what's going on out there, right? You're on the, the track of a theory, right? It, that is, if you find a, an interesting enough story, you're gonna find a theory that it, that it, that it, that it disproves or it, uh, it, uh, it challenges, right? So again, you can teach that. Um, and Jim, right, had lots of students. I look at lots of people around here who've done that. I mean, Larry, uh, Mead, I think, is, is, uh, and uh, Shep's work had, uh, especially the, the first two books, had lots of interview uh, material uh, in them. Um, I don't think this is a, a moribund tradition, and I think, you know, I think Chuck Epps uh, books, uh, who is an, I'm an enormous uh, fan of, right, have incredible, great, you know, depth, rich um, in their interviewing. So I think that, that, that if there's a methodological point about what it means to recover Wilsonianism, right? The, the methodological base of that is, go, is getting people out there in the world doing interviews again. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the, the paper and then relate to that to some of um, McGee's points. Um, part of this point, again, is about what does it mean to do something Wilsonian as opposed to just doing what Jim did, right? Um, so in the first, uh, in the original draft of the book, um, Wilson talks about uh, political leadership is involving supplying tangible and intangible incentives to individuals in order that they will become or remain members and will perform certain tasks, right? So the key aspect of organizational maintenance in the original draft of the book, right, has to do with members. Organizations have members and they have to get them to contribute, right? And that clearly, in some sense, right, um, McGee was talking about, you know, he's got less of a, a beef with Wilson than he does with Olson, right? This book is clearly aimed at Olson, right? Um, it's aimed, uh, but it's in that sense, it's trying to solve the same problem Olson's dealing with, right? Both Olson and Wilson are saying the problem of mobilizing members is the key problem of um, of the creation and maintenance of organizations, right? But then in the um, uh, the preface to the paperback edition, Wilson says that a large part of the increase in interest group numbers has arisen because of the greater use of sponsors. I use, I also use the word patron in my book, um, as opposed to members. Sponsorship has become institutionalized in the form of foundations, government agencies, pro bono work at law firms and court settlements. It is now relatively easy to start a political organization that has for all um, practical purposes, no members at all, right? And so in some sense, Wilson was saying in the, in the preface, that the entire organizational maintenance problem was different than the one that he had analyzed in the book, right? Um, it's not about how do you mobilize members, right? It's how do you acquire and maintain sponsorship, right? 
So in that, right, he, his work, and at least in the paper, I say his work and the work that Jack Walker was doing on the expansion of, um, of interest groups were really getting at the same thing, right? How do you analyze a world in which third-party funding is the central um, lifeblood of organizational maintenance, right? So the real purpose of my paper was to say, what would a Wilsonian analysis of interest groups look like for a world in which the organizational maintenance task was increasingly about mobilizing sponsors rather than members. And I argue that the important point here is that we might want to think about this as a two-level game, right, in which there's organizational maintenance issues on both sides of this relationship, right? We have the, the organizations, whether they're think tanks, right? Chris DeMuth is here, and I, uh, I rip off Chris DeMuth in, the, uh, in, in, my, in my paper. Um, uh, think tanks, uh, inter interest groups, public interest law firms, right? All these are the kind of political organizations. They all have their own internal organizational structure and constraints, right? Um, the most important, which is the acquisition of resources, right? And, um, uh, and that generates uh, their incentives. And in a world of third-party funding, um, the acquisition of resources from sponsors is the key part of, um, of the survival instinct that McGee talks about. Um, but their sponsors also have organizational maintenance incentives. Now, they're different than the organizational maintenance incentives faced by the organizations themselves, right? The organizations have to acquire resources. Their sponsors, on the other hand, are resource independent, right? They're self-financing, um, right? They have their own endowment, right? They, you know, they, they want resources. They go into the, you know, their account and they reach in and they, you know, pull out, pull out a big bag of Krugerons or whatever and there's their, they don't have to go and ask anybody, right, for their resources, right? The only question is how much of a draw they want to take on their own resources. But that doesn't mean they lack organizational maintenance um, imperatives, right? Their organizational maintenance imperatives have to do with legitimation rather than, um, than financial survival. And in the paper, I talk about where those, those legitimation imperatives um, uh, come from. Uh, but in part, right, in many points in time, they've come from the fear that the sector was uh, under threat, right, and it needed to professionalize in response to that, and that created an incentive in which foundations increasingly came to look to each other or look to norms developed within the field for cues as to their action, and therefore their organizational maintenance imperative comes from um, living up to those legitimation norms that are internally generated within that professional field. Um, so, right, so that, that's my story, and then the actual outcomes of interest groups come from the point at which the internal organizational um, uh, issues of interest groups themselves interact with the internal organizational challenges of foundations, right, and then the, uh, the actual interest groups that get produced are sort of the equilibrium outcome of those, that, that interaction. Um, so in any case, in an increasingly polarized world, we actually have a largely separate set of patrons and organizations on left and right, right? And for, um, and those have different sponsor organizational dynamics, right? And a lot of the paper is about how those dynamics work out, right? Those dynamics can either generate enormous transaction costs and distortion of organizational mission, right? Or they may help generate uh, relatively um, stable, um, uh, effective organizations uh, over time. And so part of the point of the, the paper is to say conservatives for a while had a durable competitive advantage that came from the relatively more wholesome relationship that they had with their, um, their sponsors. And again, this gave them a durable competitive advantage, right? That is holding resources constant, right? And in many cases, actually conservatives actually had fewer resources in many of these sectors than liberals did, right? But the, uh, but the sheer amount of waste and, and, um, and lack of, of ability to pursue any kind of coherent strategy that came out of the acquisition of resources from these more compromised liberal sources of, um, of uh, foundation largesse substantially hobbled at one point uh, liberals in their competition with uh, conservatives. Um, in part, this was because um, conservatives generally provided their resources to their, um, to their organizations more in terms of general operating support. So that, again, I keep using Chris as my example, but 
Um, they generally, Chris would generally go and, and acquire resources for his organization that he could then deploy within the organization. So he had effectively had control of capital inside of his organization, which is the key to being able to pursue any strategy or to mobilize or, mo or motivate um, uh, individuals. Liberals, on the other hand, right, increasingly foundations were, uh, had projects that were trying to sell to organizations that they were essentially just sort of parking in those organizations that made them kind of more like a shared real estate organization than a real coherent um, organization. And so that difference, right, the fact that conservative organizations were up to a point actually managed, right, because they were given resources that allowed their managers to deploy resources internally, and liberals, uh, for the most part, were not, gave them a comparative advantage. And the end of the paper, I say that this advantage is waning. Um, that increasingly conservative foundations and funders are being, um, uh, uh, are being pulled into the same uh, web of uh, legitimation imperatives now having to do with organizational effectiveness, metrics, measurement, all the things that we have associated with new philanthropy. Um, and therefore, they're being faced by the same pathologies that then they're, they're e e exporting to the organizations that they fund. Um, OK, just one, two points about McGee's thing, and then I'll pass it on to Mark. One, my point about constructivism, right? All I meant to say with that is that um, Jim never assumed there was a set of objective interests out there in the world, right? Um, that, you know, you could say they either were or weren't represented in politics, right? That is, he basically said, look, you know, interests are constructed all the way down, right? Interests are what some entrepreneur, and this is, again, where I'm riffing off of your work, right? What some entrepreneur can take from the the very conflicting sets of, um, of things people are doing out the world, the things they can be con convinced of, right, and then concretized into actual organizations that, that go and do something out in the world, right? That's their, their interest once that happens, right? They're not interest out in some more objective, and again, now you might say Marxian or, you know, more econ economist kind of way. That's what I mean by saying they're constructivist, right? They're, they're, um, they're constructed by... Um, organizational entrepreneurs all the way, uh, all the way down. I want to support the idea that um, we need different types of organizational models of contemporary organizations, right? Though, so third-party resources, right, is a much more common form, but it's not the only form in which organizations are getting resources, right? They're getting resources through um, uh, through uh, mobilizing different kinds of members, right? Through the internet, right? That's one kind. That's got a set of organizational maintenance imperatives that go along with it that's going to affect the internal organization of, um, of, uh, of organizations, right? The other point is about that foundations affect not just the ecology, but the internal organization of organizations. I mean, Peter is here. Um, I think of Peter's book on Mexican-Americans and the analysis of MALDEF is a great analysis, of that, right? I mean, foundations were involved all the way down in the internal structure of the Mexican-American legal defense and education Foundation, uh, one of my students, Devin Fernandez, who is Peter's uh, uh, mentee, is also working on that, right? You can think about a very wide number of the organizations that were created in the 1970s where foundations were there at the beginning all the way down in their internal structure. So they weren't passive investors, right? They were um, in some sense deeply implicated in their, uh, their basic structure. The last thing I'll, I'll say is that um, going back through this and looking over the, the book again, um, Reminded me how sad it is that Jim is passed. And I was not like, like Jim, a student of Wilson. I was a student of Jim's. Um, so I'm a student by one remove of Wilson. Uh, but the sad thing when someone like Jim passes from the world, right, is we no longer have him to ask about how we would, how are we supposed to figure these things out, right? We are given the imperative of being Wilsonian, right, without actually having Wilson here to actually help us do our work anymore. I like, I like to stand. Can I take as long as tell us? No. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I, gotta be... <laughs> I can't take as long as tell us. All right. I'll be briefer than tell us. Uh, that's a low standard. Um, having spent a lifetime stealing from Jim Wilson, I, of course, felt compelled to steal my title from Jim Wilson, uh, his, his wonderful book, uh, American politics then and now, so I called my essay Mer Political Parties Then and Now. 
Uh, and as I suspect some of the people in this room were in political organizations, seminar in 1971, maybe Porter and, and Caesar were, were my colleagues. And, you know, so I learned that paradigm. I, I, it's it's uh, embedded in, my, in the deepest recesses of my mind, and I, I sort of, that's what I know. So um, when, I, when I started to think about this paper, of course, I went back to political organizations, which was then not a book. It was, uh, Jim was in the process of writing it when we, uh, when, when I was in the seminar. Um, and I was struck by the fact that what he treats, because Jim, you know, really did, didn't like to be normative in his academic writing. He, he was very reluctant to do that. And what, what he, but what, so what he treats as incentives for organizational membership, it struck me that all the, the great defenders of political party uh, have taken and treated as functions of political party. He doesn't, he, he flirts with making a functional analysis, but I'll, basically he wants to talk about incentives. But I was struck by the fact that material, material solidary, and purposive principles are what people use to defend defend parties, and so uh, this great historical sweep, which is really just a very superficial uh, look through all the efforts to defend parties, mostly from academics, although I think Andrew Jackson is one of the most articulate uh, defenders of party, and I sort of learned that from Caesar. Uh, so since he's here, I have to say that. Um, you start, for example, in a way the most obvious is the purposive, because that's the whole responsible party literature is nothing but saying that if we can, you know, if we can have parties based on uh, on, on principles and, and, and whip them, we can do as well as Great Britain, and, and what could be greater than that? Um, material incentives, there you have the, the literature on the political machine as a as a functional notion, not the progressive attack on the machine, but the defense of the machine as a redistributive institution for uh, assimilating immigrants into the world, a, a world where they've been uh, uh, treated shabbily in almost every other way. And uh, Martin Scorsese gets it right when he in the gangs of New York he has Boss Tweed that great Protestant meeting all the Catholic Irishmen at the, uh, at the dock so that he can then begin the process of turning them into uh, good Democrats and by maybe as a latent consequence keeping them from, from going hungry. Uh, also the argument about the, the sheer necessity of getting them to pass the civics exam so they can become citizens and therefore they actually know, unlike my students, what's in the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution. Right? These, are, these are serious arguments. Um, and then the, the trickiest one, um, and the one that I, I really have to talk about in a much more complicated way, is, is the solidary. And in a way, both Jim's one of Jim's greatest contributions, and where he, of course, le helps to leave Mansur Olson in the dust, uh, is, by, is by pushing this idea that we don't just join organizations to make a buck or to, uh, uh, to push for uh, climate change, right? We join organizations because they are fraternal or sororal uh, organizations, and we play poker, and we, uh, you know, we, we might even have a tipple or two. Um, so Jim gets us going on that. I think from a functionalist point of view for why, saying why is this good for, for the regime, right? That's not so obvious because there are lots of other fraternal organizations. You can join the Boy Scouts or the Elks or, or something. Uh, there I, I do push a, a, a little bit away from, from Wilson and solidary incentives because it seems to me that the, the great articulator of how solidary incentives uh, do uh, bind people to the regime is, is my late, my other, you know, Jim, Jim Wilson is, is the right side of my brain, the left side of my brain is Carrie McWilliams, and I don't 
really know anything else. So uh, what McWilliams tried to show is that s both actually purposive, solidary, and material incentives can be functional for the regime because of the particular nature of the way our regime is constructed both uh, constitutionally and but in a crucial way also ideologically. The two, the two make it possible for us to have, and, and Jim, Jim picked up on this, uh, what what I what actually Harvey Mansfield gave me the, and when he was critiquing uh, the Milkus Landy Presidential Greatness book, he said, "You guys believe in middling parties. You don't believe in high parties or low parties." Tuckville was the great critic of both high parties and low parties. Uh, you seem to be believe that in the American tradition there was a great function for middling parties, and that that's exactly right. That's exactly right, uh, and that. That, that possibility comes, first of all, from the remarkable uh, revolution we had where, uh, and, and constitutional struggle we had where both sides, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, could agree on so many crucial points and therefore create a kind of lover's quarrel uh, in terms of the, the incipient partisanship that then takes serious form between the Federalists and the Republicans and later between the Republicans and the Whigs. Um, you know, this, this is lucky that we have a lover's quarrel, that everybody on both sides endorses a kind of understanding of classic liberal constitutional government. And then McWilliams adds uh, the crucial point that our federalist, federalism, our system of, of, of states and local authorities forces the parties to decentralize, forces uh, the parties to engage in both forming local attachments, but then also because you've got to win the presidency. That's the big prize, because that's how you're going to get the postmasterships. Aren't material incentives really wonderful? Uh, I know Jim would, 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 have, would have loved that idea, because you've got to also win the presidency. There's a possibility of linkage, that a nation that would otherwise be a nation of strangers through the party system, through the particular incentives the party system can offer because everything takes place in a certain kind of structure uh, makes this possible, right? So this is all very cheerful stuff. And of course, as Jim points out, it's all gone. Uh, there, 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 none of these possibilities uh, really remain in a, in, a, in a regime that's become centralized. Um, and so what I do, is, so in the now part of the path, having talked about then, and maybe you want to accuse me of being a little soft and sentimental, and maybe some truth to that, but when, uh, when I come to now, uh, what strikes me, first of all, is, it, is that the, is, the incentive structure is still there. There's still plenty, particularly of purposive and material incentives linked to the party system, right? That, that the trouble is that the way, the way this, this functions now is, is perverse. It's no longer functional. <coughs> Material incentives no longer are the stuff of uh, benefits for uh, immigrants coming off the boat. Right? Material benefits, material interests, uh, narrow, uh, material incentives are now elite incentives. Right? There's still plenty of pelf being given out on partisan grounds. Look at Solyndra. Right? So it's not that material incentives aren't there, but they're an elite phenomenon. Uh, purposive incentives, um, right? the responsible parties got what they want. The party advocates got what they wanted. Shame on them, right? Because, uh, because of the polarization that Jim was so articulate about, um, we, we don't function as middling parties anymore. We, we've gotten too high, it seems to me, for the well-being of the regime. We really are fighting about pretty fundamental things now. And um, it's not clear uh, how well uh, we're going to cohere uh, in, 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 the, um, uh, in the wake of that. So um, let me see what I'll say. Do I have a little more time or am I out? A little bit. Okay. So, um, oh, uh, the other bit, one big point where I, it's not, where I'm, I'm actually a little bit critical of Jim Wilson may be struck dead for it, but it, it, his notion of material incentives, 
which are, are perfectly adequate for discussing, say, political machines, where uh, uh, the incentives are exclusionary. You only get the incentive if you join the party, right? Only Democrats get office, get jobs on the, uh, in the gas house. The others don't get them. Well, as uh, one of his greatest insights, Jim's, is his discussion of the legitimacy barrier and the decline of the legitimacy barrier. And uh, in the paper, I try to, I try to uh, make, I, I talk about that quite a bit because his notion of the legitimacy barrier read more broadly is really the concrete fun uh, application of the idea of limited government. Why is there a legitimacy barrier? Because uh, the first question that you ask in a limited government is, is what we want to do constitutional, not is what we want to do good or, or even affordable. Right? And, and, and Wilson's brilliant tracing of the decline of the legitimacy barrier is the decline of asking that prior question. Now, the only question we ask, is it a good idea or not? It seems to me in the, way, in, in the wake of that, since we all now live in a world uh, uh, where the legitimacy barrier is pretty much uh, at ground level, um, it's not so easy to distinguish material and purposive incentives. This, this, this nice, clear distinction really doesn't quite work anymore. Because if you're in that, and, I, and I, in the paper I make it very personal. Mark Landy, am I for, let's say, let's say I am, I'm for uh, student loans, generous student loans program, right? Is that a great a purpose of belief in the virtue of universal higher ed, or is it a, simply a material recognition that I need those loans to prop up BC's tuition level to prop up my salary? Well, it's probably both. It's probably both. And so we're we're in it we're in an environment where we have to we have to kind of uh, reckon with that as as an enormous co complication. Well, let me just say, uh, in conclusion, that I entirely agree with. I hate to always agree with Caesar, but he's right in critici criticizing me. I, I don't do a good job of depicting modern parties as uh, as a webs of. Of interaction of organizations, I think I think that's uh, th that's exactly right. Anyway, thank you. And we shall have some we have time for some questions. Uh, Paul, yes. So, um, I was struck by the oh. comment that you always tended to agree that. Uh, it, what Jim wrote was very agreeable. Uh, I'm Paul Peterson. I'm the Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Government here at Harvard, the position that Jim Wilson held at Harvard before he left for uh, California. Uh, so I did steal something from him, I'm <laughs> pleased to say. Uh, but um, uh, so I, as I was saying, uh, the um, work that Jim wrote always was agreeable work. You wanted to agree with it. But I'm a disagreeable person by nature. So it was important for me to disagree with Wilson. And so I wrote a paper. I think I actually presented it at the American Political Science Association. I don't think it was, I know it was never published. And um, it was done bef you know, on a typewriter. So it's probably vanished. Uh, from the face of the earth, I, I, I could try to see if I could find it somewhere in a filing cabinet. Uh, but in which I s disagreed with uh, the classification scheme that everybody's been talking about, not because it wasn't the correct classification scheme, but because it had no theoretical basis to it. Uh, and the theoretical basis that I thought it should be rooted in is the one that Weber developed in reply to Marx, in which he said there's not just one hierarchy, one stratification system in society, there are three. There is class, there's status, and there's power. And that's actually what Jim is saying here. There's three kinds of incentives that are rooted into the three stratification systems of society. 
the material, which is comparable to the class, and the solidary, which is comparable to the status, the old families, the people who had the solidary really relationships that they wanted to maintain, and he's identifying that in a more widespread way, and, and power. And per to me, purpose of incentives doesn't make any sense. Purpose is what everybody has. Every, so I don't see how it can really be an incentive, but certainly there is this incentive, the desire for power, the desire to control the government and use it for your own purposes. And so what we see with, uh, and all of this has some relevance to the discussion because with, with material and solidary incentives, there were other things going on there that softened the conflict because the party organizations had to survive as a material organization for the benefit of their constituents and the solidary incentives that you had these personal relationships and ties and it all softened politics. But the raw pursuit of power is what purposive incentives was all about and that's what what made those amateur Democrats sort of oddballs. And that's what has made our politics become a, more polarized because you now have organizations that are built that are basically power-hungry organizations. They have nothing to soften their desire to get control of the public agenda and to use it for its purposes. And they depend upon foundations whose only purpose is to get power so that they can control the, the national agenda or whatever agenda it is that they're pursuing. We have more up there, yes. Yes. There aren't going to be responses, I take no. it. Oh, uh, well, you could have. Do you want to respond to that? No, it didn't seem to no, I, I, I have, I have a, a, a little but, uh, response. I take, yeah, it, as, I take uh, it as a comment. Uh, just on the last one there. Um, Go on. Uh, on purpose, uh, uh, I, I think that who's got um, the floor? P power is just as abstract as, as purpose. But I think what what Wilson was getting at is uh, the thing that motivates the people to join is say a view of justice or their view of justice, not just the power, but the the view to do something right, as distinct from uh, let's say material you're getting something for yourself. So um, ideology isn't a good word because it's uh, that's an all embracing view of justice, but views of justice, and that's. That's uh, w what comes to for these uh, views of justice, and that uh, purpose is a, a pretty good word for that. Now, it's true that they, they seek power, but the reason they seek power is for this idea of the good, and, and that's what begins to clash, uh, different ideas of the good. And of course, when you're having clashes of ideas of the good or, or views of justice, sometimes it's harder to compromise, whereas um, on those other means, there's usually more grounds for compromise. So um, I don't know. Um, where did Weber get his from? <laughs> History. Do you have more response up here? Well, I, I thought we were going to collect some comments. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, go okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Peter Scarry. I wanted to um, um, press Jim Caesar and a, a little bit Mark Landy. I, I take it, first of all, Jim Caesar's not planning on running for president since he's uh, so uh, readily characterized uh, political parties as payoff schemes. If you were thinking of running for president, I advise you not to, having said that. Um, and, be a great and I wanted to at the same time introduce you to Mark Landy, um, who doesn't seem to think that material incentives are important at all in politics anymore. Um, it's like you were saying, Mark, uh, or that they don't work for immigrants. I beg to differ. Uh, it was a big payoff to immigrants in the last election, something called the Deferred Action for Childhood Admissions, which basically gave uh, uh, legalized status uh, to um, immigrants. It was, a, was clearly a ploy, uh, a probably well-advised ploy to Hispanics and was obviously very successful. Um, but my real question is to Jim Caesar and to try to press him to tease out, if he would, um, if political parties are nothing more than payoff schemes, um, well, you know, Jim, Jim was, uh, in his typology, uh, material incentives were clearly seen as the m m more acceptable, the least problematic, the le most fungible, the easily, most easily dealt with in terms of organizational maintenance. Um, so, um, what exactly is, is, the, is your critique? What bothers you more here? That the parties are payoff schemes or that they're um, simply or somehow at the same time dedicated to propulsive goals? Or is it both or, or, or what? I mean, I'd like you to kind of elaborate. Can we, okay, you go 
Yeah, do you want to? I'll go because I'll, go, I'll, I'll be brief. No, it's not that material uh, incentives aren't important. It's that they're not important for at the at the at, at the level of ordinary people. They're no longer important in as exclusionary material incentives. And your and your example is perfect. What what every uh, pot potentially any immigrant would benefit from that. They don't have to join the party. That's that's the key in the old in in the in the more traditional notion of material incentives. You had to join. Um, and uh, but I can I just say a word about uh, about Paul too. I th I think among the mysteries, as as Travis asks us to think about it, I mean, it's remarkable the degree to which purposiveness pur oh purposiveness has become often very narrow. You know this rather narrow issue, rather than some big idea about the class struggle or something that seems more uh, kind of uh, visionary. Uh, a lot of the people get really purposiveness is so critical to our politics, but I'm struck by how people can just get they're they're going to give their life over to you know making sure that um, uh, toys are safer or or something rather particular rather than well I think in the in an older notion of purposiveness was some big idea about broad change of the society. Well, first of all, um, what I was expressing at that point was I was summarizing Mark, uh, not, not, al not always speaking for myself, but uh, to come uh, to his defense on this point. I think Mark's point is uh, that the purpose of incentives, or the material incentives that um, Wilson and Banfield more or less found acceptable were uh, small and petty uh, jobs, um, the things that machines did, turkeys, yeah, material, yeah, th they were small and petty, and therefore, uh, um, though in a way demeaning, uh, um, o only Ed Banfield could find the, uh, the machine somehow romantic. I don't think Wilson ever went that far, <laughs> but uh, they were demeaning, but they were a price you could pay, uh, pay for uh, a kind of stable, moderate politics. Okay, and um, I think Mark's point is that the, uh, the current payoffs are of a, uh, of a different order altogether uh, in their size and scale. Um, and in fact, the, uh, uh, maybe uh, put it this way, the, the problem at the, with the paper at this point is, is he talking about organizations, that is what keeps the organizations, is he talking about getting voters? It's a somewhat different thing. I mean, uh, and, and what I think you could say modern politics is, uh, is based on clientelism. Um, this would be the politics of the left, is to, uh, at the same time that you do justice and you do good, you also pick up uh, clientele groups that need you to stay in power. Now, the, the, the problem uh, people raise, well, what, uh, as after a certain point, they're no longer exclusionary. Example would be Social Security. That was a program of the left. But gee, look at the voting statistics from 2012. More old people voted Republican than Democrat because you get that automatically. However, in the short term, uh, the fact that you've given a clientele group something, they're going to remember it at least for a little while and, and privilege uh, uh, support your party. And the other thing is, if the other party opposes that uh, clientele benefit, then it's a constant reminder that uh, you'll lose this. This isn't as an organization member, this is as a voter. And this is the logic that comes in. If the other party is going to be elected, I'm not going to have my benefit. And this was a large part, I think, of the 2012 election, that the Republicans were going to take away certain of the benefits that the Democrats granted. This is a huge strategy of the parties of the left. Uh, this, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not something cynical. It's just how they operate. Their idea of doing good also has the advantage of creating clientele groups that support them, as long as the other party questions those, those clientele advantages. And... Um, this is why I think parties of the right um, can never hope to achieve the, the same level of support as parties uh, uh, of the left in America. Their, their ceiling is, is lower, I think, for that reason. Anyhow, that, that's uh, what I, and Mark gave you the examples of uh, Solyndra, uh, payoffs to the p public employees' unions. These are more uh, clientele-type gambits, uh, which were, I think, a huge part of the, the uh, voting strategy, as it were of the stimulus pack, uh, bill of 2009. That was just a, a, a cornucopia <laughs> of such advantages. Let's go back. Let's go up here. We're running out of time.
a garbage man. What does small mean to, uh, to the jobs weren't so small to the immigrants who needed them. Right. No, were right. they small to the elites who felt that they were being the, the fist was being stolen? James Michael Curley drove the city of Boston into bankruptcy from which it suffered for several generations and has barely emerged now. So I don't know what it means to be small and petty. That, that doesn't make any sense. I think you're, you're redefining the problem. Let's go up here. Question up here. Who had a hand up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Steve Kelman from the Kennedy School. So as, as I listen to the discussion, I'm going to move it back to the purpose of issue, which I agree with Jim as being involving larger values and I mean if it's just power I mean power you know look at youth gangs and cities they're fighting for turf and power with each other there's not I mean I don't think I have a hard time thinking of that as purposive so I, I would agree with Jim's definition but um, but I guess my question my observation is about when I hear some of the discussions and the discontents about the role of purposive purposiveness in our politics and its relation to, to polarization I'm a little bit reminded of, we haven't talked today or yet about what you call it, multiculturalism, globalization, different demographic kinds of groups in our society and, and other societies, which also raises problems of polarization and, and, and so forth. I guess, I, I mean, you could make an argument that both of these things, that, that purposiveness with the rise of education and multiculturalism with globalization, lower costs of travel, uh, and so forth, uh, international trade, are both things that are just going to be happening. They're sort of secular trends, at least. Let me, let me stipulate that, or at least suggest that they're secular trends. And then I think we have sort of a, you could either say they're secular trends and despite problems with polarization or whatever, the benefits outweigh the costs, and let's just, these secular trends are good. You could make the opposite argument, the costs outweigh the benefits, they may be secular trends, but the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Or you could make an argument, which I'm sort of more inclined to think that we ought to be talking about, uh, let's call it a governance challenge, that given the, I mean, I, I guess I don't think it's inevitable that two groups that have different ideological views about, let's say, the role of government necessarily can't reach compromises, or I don't think there's anything inevitable about that. I think there, there are tendencies towards that. But I guess I would invite all of us to ask ourselves whether it be involving ideology and polarization or the thing we haven't talked about, take globalization, multiculturalism, you know, different groups, to think of both of them as different sorts of governance challenges that we might want to think about how might we do a slightly, at least slightly better job than we are in dealing with some of the downsides so as to be able to take advantage of the, of the, of the pluses. Can I respond again? Okay. I just want to say one point that sort of pulls together some things people said, and in a way to go back to Paul's point, which I, I thought at the beginning I was definitely going to disagree with, and then I, I, I found myself against myself agreeing with, um, that I, I do think there's an important story about the linkage between the rise of third-party funding the increasing significance of purposive incentives and polarization. I think that's a really important mechanism. But again, I think there you have to be subtle. I think even on your issues, right, on education issues, um, there's an argument that goes in the opposite direction, right, that actually uh, foundations have had a kind of collective agreement that they really didn't want this issue to get totally pulled into the fully polarized maw, right? They wanted to make sure that there continued to be Democrats in favor of school choice. You know, I have a particularly intimate view into this for reasons I can go into over drinks. Um, but, um, but, I, but so, so I, and I think also on environmental issues for a long time, actually, foundations were pushing um, even environmentalists in the opposite direction, right? That is, they, they often were saying, you know, it's really important for you to get cross-party support for these things. In fact, they almost hardwired that into their assumption of how you were supposed to be pursuing any kind of coalition, even after the political foundations of that had kind of crumbled, right? That is, when there were no longer... I mean, Theda Scotchwell has this great paper about what happened with the um, uh, the uh, 
global warming, right, and that the, these foundations were continuing to push a particular strategy about how you got something passed, which is you had to pull together sponsors from both parties, right? They had a, that hardwired into how they were giving funding, and that to, up to a point was a break on the polarization that was otherwise prevalent in the, in the larger political system. So while in general, I think, the foundation world has gotten more polarized, and that's created larger incentives for... Um, uh, for polarized conflict in, in organizations. I think there are enough examples that go in the other direction that you wouldn't want to say that as an iron law. Got time for one more show up, up here? Yes. Uh, no one's commented on the anomaly that uh, Wilson was an intellectual, and yet he was most at home in the unintellectual politics of the 50s and 60s, which was mostly about material incentives. Then we go forward 20, 30 years, and we have a much more intellectual politics where he should have been more at home. He's less at home. Uh, meanwhile, other intellectuals, which is most of political science, you would think they would be more at home in this. And in fact, there was a lot of anti-intellectual commentary about the politics of the 50s and 60s. Now in the new politics, uh, intellectuals should be more at home than Jim was, but they find to their distress that uh, politics is actually dominated by the right. This intellectual era has also been an era of largely conservative influence. So the political war has been won more by the right than the left anyway, and that's partly because of the fact that it shifted towards these uh, purposes of appeals, which have apparently been more effective on the right than the left overall. And there's another factor as well, and that is that uh, much of academia today, we'll be talking about this more tomorrow, has become so specialized in its research that it's no longer very intellectual. The average political science professor today isn't really interested in politics in that old-fashioned sense. So the ground is now cleared, in a way, of a lot of purpose of argument. Uh, and that has made, there's purpose of argument going on in politics, but in the university, that's really not the case. So Jim's distaste for that kind of politics, and in a sense, you could say he's won out, but not in the way that he wanted. Yes, some last uh, reflections yeah. here. Well, yeah, I'd like to reflect that. just a little briefly. To okay, um, I'm just going to, Larry. I, I think that the rights hegemony in 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 the ordinary political world you're ex over exaggerating, given current matters. But what really, I, I really want to press everybody to read the preface to American Politics Then and Now by Jim Wilson. It is really the pithy, it's even by Wilson standards, it's pithy, because it's only about three or four pages long, but he really wants to ask, where did this turn in our politics come from? And he does put great store on this idea that was very popular in the 70s and 80s. The term is no longer so popular, but there's probably still a lot of traction to it, the new class. He wants to understand how did the university uh, transform itself into a very ideologically homogeneous operation. And he doesn't offer, again, he doesn't really have he just says, "Let's talk. Let's let's study this." He doesn't have a a, a real uh, uh, roadmap for it, but it's. I wouldn't be surprised if he was still with us. If he would be conducting interviews and trying to understand how did a university uh, lose its intellectual diversity? It's a remarkable thing. Anybody else on the panel? I might just add that. Um in 1998, uh, Frank Baumgartner wrote a book called Basic Interest, which uh, captured the, the state of interest groups research in political science. And the take home uh, phrase from that book was elegant irrelevance. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a, an elegant irrelevance to a lot of political science research uh, that I think some reflection today on the importance of Wilson cast that in even a, a paler light, um, and that we'd all be well served to think about how we move the discipline forward uh, and into more engaged and, uh, and uh, informed uh, research. I do think we need to fold, so um, thanks to the panel. Excellent. Okay. okay. I hate to be responsible for stopping it just as we're discussion is really getting going, but I have two <coughs> logistical matters. The first relates to material incentives. If you want dinner, <coughs> um, you should go to the Harvard, uh, the Inn at Harvard, um, and we'll, in about 15 minutes we will uh, convene there. Uh, the second relates to solidary incentives. Um, if you want to have people know who you are tomorrow, you should take your name tags with you. 
Uh, so we will reconvene in about 15 minutes at the Inn in Harvard. Inn at Harvard.